Thank you for kind introduction. Yesterday, I was awarded with the Kyoto Prize 2016. It was the great honor for me indeed. I was awarded in the category of advanced technology. My research field is what we call computer vision and intelligent robots. Image from camera will be processed and interpreted with the computer. That means we try to realize artificially the visual function of human eyes and produce the intelligent robots. What it's like to do our type of research, let me give you one example. By the way, one request to the audience. Let me make request. Sometimes I have been living in the United States, the characteristics to the American professor, sometimes I make some type of joke. If you sense that that might be a joke, and then please make a big laughter, and then the meeting will be excited, and we will perhaps have fun. So I ask for your cooperation. When you drive a car in the rainy night, you have uh, lots of trouble of the visibility because there are white streaks of the raindrops with the headlight. Raindrops is the water and transparent however that reflects well the light. And then into our eyes, that is the white spot, therefore, in rainy night, we have the trouble in seeing it through the background. Isn't that possible to get rid of those rain streaks and the raindrops? I know the reason why the raindrops is white. The answer is very easy. When it's raining, and then we will identify the position of the raindrops, and headlight should be avoided to hit the raindrops. Light should slip through raindrops. Then we can see the good visual landscape as a background. We will not see the raindrops. We will not feel like it's a rainy day. You may wonder that's a magic impossible, but it's rather easy. First of all, the speed of the raindrop is not so fast. Diameter is 10 millimeter or so, so the speed is maximum 10 meter per second is the likely figure. And we have the slow speed of response. But if you have the very short exposure, one millisecond, for example, one thousands, then we can see the raindrops. And then we can identify in which position or location raindrops are. That is not so difficult. Now we will prepare the project, uh, exactly the project uh, over there in this auditorium. On the same position, we will place the camera. The good idea of this system is that the raindrops will be lit with the light. And from the raindrops, light will come back. And that's exactly the identical places. Therefore, if we can identify the raindrops location, then we know in which direction that light can be drawn. Exactly speaking, physically speaking, we cannot have the camera and the projector at the same position. Therefore, half mirror is placed with the degree of 45. Then this is the location for camera. And the mirror can reflect the light. Then confocal system is now realized with this placement. Therefore, what should we do? That's explained here. Now rain started soon, and then the light's given, and then we will take a shot. And then on the image, we can see the location of the raindrops, and then to each of the drops of the rain, each light beam can be turned off, then that light beam will not hit the raindrops. That's possible. Of course, 
not 100% of the control is not done. Some percentage may hit the raindrops. If we want to avoid then turn off the headlights, that's the easiest solution. Then we cannot drive, therefore we should turn on the headlights. So what we should do is that if we send the lights 100, and then how much percentage can avoid hitting the raindrops? That is what we call throughput. How to maximize the throughput is the issue. And in reality, even though it's speedy, there is a requirement for process time to identify the position of raindrops and processing the images. And raindrops have the gravity movement. That should be considered to some degree, but that's too much of the details and not significant issue. What we are thinking about is smart headlight. As you can see on the left projector is placed and the camera. Sorry. To camera here and with half mirror positioning is confocal and then computer is connecting with the processing. This is the actual design projector was purchased. We make a retrofit. Current projector is composed of DMD. Very, very minute mirrors are arrayed in matrix and a strong intensity light is given and each mirror can be changed with the direction to control the free image projection. But for our research purpose, we need much faster speed. This DMD chip should be controlled much faster. So some modification is given. And then just in front of those, half mirror given for focal position. And computer connects the two placed in the box brought to the garage and mounted on the automobile. So this is the new headlight. This is the new smart headlight. And if we see the rain, we don't see so much rain. We see some, but not so much. Well, this was designed that way, so therefore light is not hitting the water drops. How about the snowflakes? This is artificial snowflakes, but it's much paler than the visual eyes detection. So smart headlight, which wipes off the raindrops and the snowflakes, will not be commercially realized tomorrow. However, there is a more realistic application. That means high beam, low beam, switch while you are driving at night. When you drive the car, you want to have high beam because you can visually see well ahead, especially in the countryside. However, if you use the high beam, if the car is coming towards you, and then the driver of that oncoming car will have the instantaneous blindness that is called glare. That's very risky. A 55-year-old like me, I'm much older than that, takes eight times longer to recover from glare than a 16-year-old. Eight times higher. That means that eight times longer time to recover from the glare. Very risky. No need to switch to high beam, low beam every time. That means that if the light is coming to the oncoming car driver, only that light should be stopped. Is that possible? You might ask. But if a pair of two lights are coming and that is expanding the diameter, that is supposed to be the headlights of the oncoming car. And driver sees this from your point of view in the United States, upper right. In the case of Japan, upper left, there should be the place for drivers. So the light beam to that direction should be turned off. If we test this, as you can see on top, 
we see always high beam, so good visibility. However, oncoming cars driver doesn't have any problem. So from our side, always high beam, but for the upcoming cars, low beam. Another useful things can be used for the safety. We have the automated driving in today, and now the car knows at which lane they should run. And strong light can be emitted, especially that's important in the countryside because there's no borderline between the roads and non roads. And using the laser sensor or infrared camera, much faster than the human eyes, we can detect the far away pedestrians or the bicycles rider. We can detect those. Then we can emit more lights into that direction, then more safety can be obtained, especially with the navigation system. Only our personal navigation message can be drawn, and that type of function can be mounted on the headlights of a truck. On the research level, that is already realized. If we further think on this principle, camera and projectors are having the complete dual relationship. That means exactly the same characteristics, just the direction of the light is different. We can control the incoming and outcoming lights. That is a projector camera system. Then we have multi-level of control of the degree of freedom. This is not to my work, but my colleague in the United States, Professor Slinibas Narasimham is doing this research for sensors. Smart headlight was quoted as example. Think like an amateur and execute like an expert. That is my motto. And smart headlight can be the good example of doing that. Usually, the idea is straightforward, simple. We don't want to see the raindrops while we are driving. That's the very honest and open mind question. And what is the hampering issue? That is, the like an expert or professors or the experts, usually they complain first. Well, if you say that uh, isn't this possible, then most of the time the refusal or denial are coming from the experts. Professor would like to appeal that I know more than the amateur. That is the obsession. If somebody is trapped with that obsession, if students come up with a good idea, you don't know it. That's in 1965, such and such doctor made a failure. There is a published paper. Or sometimes we are inclined to say that. And then only the amateur can come up with a good invention. No way. For the execution, we need expertise, experts, knowledge, and technique is required. Let's think about the Easy example, automotive drying. So if the car goes to right, and then we should steer handle to left. And if the other way, the other way handle should be steered. And then can we make a automobile driving to straight direction? No, that will have the tortuous ways, because that is the gain should be considered. Otherwise, the Automobile cannot make a straight driving. That means the quantification of the deviation should be well considered. Now, what is the scenario for the future realization? Well, sometimes we have the good expandability from one idea. If we can make one success, one after another, much better ideas could be generated. I hope uh, you will agree with me if I tell this type of story, 
Usually, most of the audience will say to me, that's interesting. Then if we change this way, then isn't that more useful? I have this type of chip, this type of idea, technology, isn't that applicable? Many people raise their hands. That means that the one good idea can have the good effect to stimulate other people. For the last 40 years, I have researched it computer's vision intelligent robot. As I said, my approach is based on the extremely simple idea. But among those attempts, I was very lucky and I enjoyed the research life. Let's review my childhood. I was introduced already in 1945. I was born in Kayano countryside in the Hyogo prefecture. I remembered many of the things. We were living in a rented house, very small in countryside. We have an earthen floor kitchen, small veranda. In front of it, there was a small garden and well. Backside, there was a small stream. We played around and we took the loaches with the net basket. Elementary school is a bit up from our house, alongside of the prefectural road. One class has only 10 students, small classes. But I don't remember exactly the details of my childhood. I have two elder sisters, two elder brothers, so I was the youngest child. And according to my sisters, I was so stubborn. I hated to lose. Once I started to insist something, I cling to earth until I was listened to. I did not move an inch. I thought that the, I myself was the docile, a reasonable child. Therefore, it's hard to imagine. And we moved to Kobe City in the first grade, and then we lived in the Kobe City. Many people asked me that, uh, were you thinking to become the researchers for the robot engineers from the small childhood? I don't think so. But I picked up many kind of material, and I produced something and I tried for use. I was fond of those. I still have memory. I wanted to make a fishing tackle, the wire bent with the pairs of pliers, and uh, that was moved to the shape of the fish hook, tried to line a bait worm on the hook. However, we couldn't get the fish because I needed the barb projection extending backward from the point to hook the fish. That was vexation. I had children, so therefore, I do not have the hobby of fishing. But including the DIY, I love to produce things. Once at home, if some equipment, furniture, home electric appliances got breakdown, I will deassemble and I can make a successful repair. So my wife always said to me, the companies which sold the product to you, the sales is just once only. Therefore, you are not a good customer. In 1964, I graduated from the high school. I entered into the Kyoto University Faculty of Engineering, Department of Electric, Electronic Engineering. I didn't think about that well. My elder brother said that Kyoto should be the place, so I went to Kyoto. And that was the era of the economic growth of Japan, so everybody wanted to join the engineering department. And for the electric and electronics, recruiting number of students was largest, so I thought that the probability uh, assumption of layman that even though the competition rate is the same, because they recruit more of the students, probably failure rate would be lower. And I have had the habit that uh, I have the simple reason and I easily influenced by other person to make decision. But I was very much encouraged in Kyoto and I was living in the lodged house in Kitashirakawa or Murasaki no. I visited most of the shrines and also the pathways, temples. But I didn't try Mahjong at all, which was a sort of essential subject for all the students in a way. Whenever 
I met the good theory or the textbooks or English book. I read it through and I had a self-pleasure. I still have a lots of books with the hand-stained. Those were the books that I used to read in college, the university days. I had a great confidence that I was able to read through those books. I think that has a good influence in my life. In 1968, I graduated from the Kyoto University, went up to the graduate school. I decided to join the lab of Professor Toshiyuki Sakai. Dr. Sakai said a computer is not a machine only to calculate. That's a processing machine for image and voice and recognition also personal computer and a mobile phone can process the voice or the images that's taken for granted today. However, in those days, it was the innovative idea. I got the big influence. I did not have the deep philosophical thought like a Descartes and so on. However, having said that, I quite agreed to the theory of human-machine theory, therefore essay written by the Adam Turing for the artificial intelligence or the steps toward artificial intelligence written by Marvin Minsky, those paper was read by myself, and I had a strong belief that it's in a short time, and it's obvious that we will have artificial intelligence equal to or superior to human beings. In Professor Sakai's laboratory, we had the good experiences, and that made a skeleton for my researcher's life. First of all, always, Professor Sakai said, first in the world should be the aim. Interesting, have fun should be the aim. Information science was very much behind in Japan compared with the United States. Still, we should aim to become first one in the world, and interesting invention should be made. And that motivated all the members in the research laboratory. Again, Professor Sakai used to say this. Theory, application, software, hardware, regardless of those, we should have comprehensive thinking for one system. But that was an important lesson. Another important lesson was given by the then associate professor, Makoto Nagao. He became the president of Kyoto University. So before and after, uh, the big picture is the young days of the then associate professor, Makoto Nagao. He said that the doing the research should have the specific goals. You may say that that's, of course, a natural matter, but it's rather difficult to do. As the researchers, many tend to forget. Perhaps I should tell my own experience when I was a graduate student. I was good at solving the mathematical questions. And whenever I read the theoretical thesis, I thought that it's easy. I can find the theorem or other theory. However, research is different from examination. There is no known issues with the known solution. Therefore, we read this and gave it up, and then we read another one, and again, I reached a dead end, and I got very much anxious. And then I was rescued by Dr. Nagao. Mr. Kanade, you should have the specific goals in your research. And also, he gave me the existence of the individual digital image data having of the 1,000 people's face. If you can create a program to process this database in correct way, that is the good research. That database of the image was exhibited in 1970 Osaka World Expo in Japan. My colleague, Kido, uh, he became later the professor of Nara Institute of Science and Technology, and that data was the exhibited, and all the visitors to that attraction building was stored with the facial image. 
1,000 pieces of digital facial images. That was the biggest scale of database in those days. And with the specific goal, now progress, one after progress, and I made a success in getting the degree of the doctorate. First full-scale research in facial image process recognition. After graduating the graduate school in 1973, I got the job of assistance at the Kyoto University. And then one great person visited Kyoto University who influenced me greatly later. Professor Alan Newell of the Department of Computer Machine from the Carnegie Mellon University of the United States. He was one of the father for the inter artificial intelligence. We demonstrated our own research. And I said to the professor that I want to visit the United States. And then one year since 1977, I was invited to be an invited researcher at the Carnegie Mellon University because of his kindness. In the Carnegie University, environment was totally different for calculation. In Japan, we used to have the batch process, and a computation center was located to have the coverage of the whole university. That was ordinary in Japan. However, in CMU, in each of the department, as a 24 hours around operation of the TSS calculation machine. Well, even for me, the researcher CRT terminal was supplied even to home, just 50 ball, an imaginary ultra slow speed circuits. But in the extra cold days in winter, still we were able to program during day or night time. And ARPANET, that was a prototype of internet today, was available in the research centers and university. Mail, file transfer, talk, or chatting was already in existence. And free font or hit bitmap display or graduation image print was usable. That means that the, what we are doing for the computer machine of course, functional level was different, but 40 some years ago, already in the United States, states, all those were operated. Now, this is my research as the guest researcher in the United States. It looked like chair. If you are given with this type of linear view, how to recover the shape? Well, human beings can image the shape in 3D. But with the computer, we started. We tried many things, but it didn't go so well. And then, as I mentioned, the big professor, I just met him on the corridor. Professor Newell asked me, Takeo, what are you doing? I was typical Japanese. I'm not doing well things. I will tell you when I complete it. That's OK. Before you came up with the result, you should tell me. So he invited me to his room. And I was just a young researcher, but Professor Newell listened to me with his whole body and soul, asking a lot of questions. And then he all of a sudden said that, uh, what's the difference with the Wolf theory? Wolf theory was one of the very famous successful mathematical theory for the artificial intelligence for the linear view interpretation. I knew it. However, if we input this linear view, then Wolf's theory could not solve. Therefore, I said to Professor Newell, all of a sudden I came up with some comments that I am aiming at the much flex more flexible ways, Professor. That's what I commented without understanding the meaning. And I came back to my room and then I thought about all night. What do I mean when I said more flexible? Well, I am trying to do the more difficult things, which is not be solved by the old theory. Then what's the difference? I well thought upon that. Then all of a sudden, I got an idea. Both theory is like on the left. That type of picture is expected. But for human beings, usually we draw the linear image like on the right. What's the difference? Wolf theory can be handled with Wolf theory, but Wolf theory cannot handle the right-hand side. 
The difference is the Waltz theory requires body volume. That's the basic unit. But what we are going to do is the surface. Surface is the basic unit. That's exactly the difference for not flexible or more flexible methods. I all of a sudden got an idea, and immediately I made a program. And then I came up with a good theory, that is the origami theory, or folding paper theory. I named it, and I made a paper. So in that field, I think I made some contribution. What I learned is that uh, it's very important to talk our idea to other people. That means they're not asking for the good advice. That's not the reason. By talking to other people, we can summarize the current thought. What is the insufficiency? And listening to the other person's response, we can well continue to think. Later, to Professor Newell, Professor, thanks to your comments and questions, I came up with success. And the professor said, did I ask that question? Well, usually that's life, so better to talk to other people. I stayed one year and a half in the United States. This is my wife and the son, and we had a good, gorgeous travel, having lectures here and there of the University and Research Institute. Soon after I came back to Japan, I got a phone call from Professor Reddy at CMU. The Robotic Institute will open at CMU, and I was invited officially there as a researcher. So in the following year, April, I moved to CMU. It was uh, the biggest decision that I made and the biggest change I experienced in my life as a researcher. My title was a senior researcher for five years. Um, it was a bit unstable compared with the stable position that I got in Japanese university, but I didn't took it too seriously because I had already learned that I can uh, triple the intensity and efficiency of the research at CMU. So if I stay for five years, that will be worth 15 years. And I told my wife that we will be coming back to Japan in five years, and I moved. And then my new life as a full-time researcher and faculty at CMU started. I knew what was going on, but now I am a regular worker, so there are several surprising things. Soon after I moved to CMU, one student visited me. He wanted to be my student. I'm glad to hear that. One week after that, another student came to me to be my student. I'm very popular. I accepted him. Soon after, the other student came to me to want to be my student again. I was very glad. However, at the end of the month, um, and the accounting officer of the department sent an email to me asking how I'm going to pay their tuition of these three students. The tuitions and the board and meals. Really? Do I have to pay for all of them? It was really surprising. Unlike in Japan, in Japan, students pay themselves, but in the U.S., professor will have a budget and then have to collect the money to pay for the graduate students. CMU is a private university. The tuition fee is very high, so it will be a huge amount of money for me. How could I afford that? I was in trouble. So I asked for help uh, to Professor Reddy. He said that I can charge him. It was a very big relief. Well, like this, uh, Professor Reddy was a bold decision maker, came up with a big project and concept, and involved all the people around him. Uh, you know, um, it is a very big shoes to fill. But at least I wanted to do something ahead of others in research, and I wanted to do something bigger than what other people are doing. 
There was an embarrassment and surprise and amazement at CMU, but I get too used to it, and eventually I end up staying at CMU for the following 35 years. I am a big liar to my wife. But in the meantime, I did many things as a part of my research. Um, I just listed and I encountered to this one after another. Looking at this project, well, um, I would like to pick up two or three of them uh, to talk about more. Four years after I went to the U.S., I started a project about autonomous driving. Initially, it was a very small cart, and then we developed something big. We used a van um, and to have the cameras and computers on board. And uh, as you can see, even the researchers can be carried by this vehicle. This was a nav lab, a uh, combination of navigation and laboratory. This was a laboratory. And the nav lab had eventually 10 versions from number one to number 10. And initially, uh, this was driven very slowly in the park, but um, it went out to the suburb and also to the highways. And then thanks to uh, lots of papers and uh, activities of the staff members, uh, this came to have a function of the, the, to detect uh, in, in order to keep the lane, change the lane, do the parallel parking, to detect the other vehicles and pedestrians. Most of the currently necessary function for self-driving have already been achieved by this, albeit um, it was not perfect. This child, this child, um, and this was a make-believe. This is a son of the program writers. Uh, this uh, researcher prepared the programs so that the vehicle will stop when detecting the obstacles. But the biggest thing about this NAV lab project was very powerful and uh, influenced greatly to the subsequent research. This was no hands across America. Uh, the, this vehicle um, the, was driven across the American continent from Pittsburgh to San Diego. Uh, some 3,000 miles or 4,500 kilos, 98 percent of this distance was driven autonomously with a computer vision successfully. This was 21 years ago. With this, uh, we were able to show the possibility of autonomous driving to the general public. In January 2001, Super Bowl was held. It was a Super Bowl 35, and a system called iVision was developed for this, and this was an epoch-making event. In the spring the year before, I got a call from CBS. They wanted to reproduce something like Matrix in the football stadium. Have you watched Matrix, the film? How many of you have watched it? Um, I didn't, actually. But according to what I heard, that, um, that the protagonist will jump and in the air and turn. To have that kind of image, these cameras, many of them were located surrounding the studio, and at the center, the actor performs. And then in an important event or the occasion, the, all the cameras will take picture. And by Im the sequencing the image, 
And it seems to be like looking at this actor from 30, uh, 360 degrees. They wanted to do the same in a football stadium. However, the stadium is huge and nobody can tell exactly where the game-changing play will take place. So we cannot locate the camera from the beginning. So now we added the function of a camera for panning, tilting, focusing, and zooming. This can be now automatically controlled with the robot, and all of them were installed at the top of the stadium. And it is controlled so that uh, the, all the cameras can track the same point of a play, just like Matrix. This system needed to be developed. And this is uh, Tampa, Florida. On the second floor, around this area, there are cameras, tens of cameras. It was scary, actually. It's very steep, and it's 150 meters across. We have to be able to zoom this distance with accurate control. Basic underlying study for eye vision started as early as 1993. More than 50 video cameras are located surrounding this dome at CMU. And the, whatever happens will be recorded by these cameras, and you can look at it afterward from any angle you would like. We have started this kind of research in 1995 or so. And our slogan was, you know, we enjoy the freedom of doing anything. So uh, we wanted to virtualize reality, and our slogan was, let's watch NBA on the court. We can watch NBA with hundreds of cameras, and that is turned into 3D images, so the viewers can enjoy the a basketball play from any angle you like. Um, so iVision was a kind of extension of this technology. I developed the system uh, first in 1995. I was told that it is totally unrealistic to use this many cameras. But now the similar multi-camera systems are already used by many companies and research institutes, and this kind of media is already a norm at CMU. We have a system of 480 cameras. Uh, there is one more example, that is the video tracking. Uh, that is also the most basic question for computer vision. This is a pattern, the first one and the second one. What is the flow or the movement? We want to get to the value for u vector. Mathematically, as you can see here, we look for the approximation with this pattern, and we continue that process. However quick the computer is, it will take time to elucidate all the locations. So we did a research to speed this up. And the, my fellow uh, the researcher was Bruce Lucas. Uh, Bruce Lucas is the first student who wanted to work under me. And uh, one day, he visited me in my laboratory, and he said he hit upon a good idea. You know, U is generally small, so uh, the function f, we can use a Taylor expansion. And so we are going to approximate up to this first one, and then uh, the, there will be uh, the quadrat quadratic expression. By using that, we have the simple calculation to come up with this formula. He said that this is a wonderful idea, so he wants to put this into the paper. But I told him, you know, I don't know. You know, Taylor expansion has been known for more than uh, 300 years. And this equation is self-evident even for a high school student. You know, um, I may lose my prestige if you write this kind of a simple thing. But he insisted to write a paper, so I finally relented. OK, but you will just publish this paper in a low-profile conference only. So he did. 
And uh, actually, uh, this paper was not submitted to any journal of academic society. However, unexpectedly, this became one of the most famous papers among the 500 papers I wrote. This was most uh, cited paper, uh, cited more than 10,000 times. And this method uh, came to be called Lucas Canade method, and this was used for various image processing or the motions and MPEG. You are also using this, and also uh, the other imaging of the movement. In various applications, this is one of the most pervasively used algorithm in image processing. If Guru Lucas uh, was uh, listening to my advice, and there will be no Lucas Canade method, and also I would not be here to talk in front of you. So since then, my message to the student is that most of the thing the professor says are wrong. The value of the paper or the value of the research is not about superficial novelty. We need to be able to identify what is the value or the benefit out of that research. Now, um, I would like to talk about the research which is fun and also useful. When I talk with the people, the wonderful people, wonderful researcher, I always notice that they seem to be very enjoying about their research. They would like to say um, as follows, let's pick up this question. This question seems to be very easy, but not really. Um, and the simplest possibility is this, but this created this difficult problem. So I came up with another idea, and then I found out this solution. If this is true, I can solve this problem and other problems too. Um, their chat goes like this. And when I listen to them, um, I'm not just a listener. I am also drawn to that conversation, and I feel as if I am one of the researchers who would like to work together with him to solve the problem. So what happens and how it is developed, there is a narrative associated to the research. This narrative includes the motivation, the frame, and the method, and also other clear ideas. But uh, the, the underlying excitement of the research is eventually how we can utilize this research for the benefit of the society. In the information science, innovative technology or the discovery of the phenomena are created by those who have a very pra uh, practical needs. An example is a transistor. It was bulky, uh, the, uh, the vacuum tube was bulky and short-lived. In order to replace uh, the vacuum tube, transistor came into the world. And uh, the computation network um, that eventually led to internet started with the shielding of the computer for the military from the missile attacks. You may say that this computer network is a patchwork of the simple technology, but it is not the case. There is a packet communication, multi-layer communications, and the virtualization of the communication. There were uh, the innovative technology and the discovery that were needed. One of the uh, the, uh, the father of AI and Nobel uh, laureate, um, Professor Simon at the CMU said to me once, um, this is a um, science of artificial. It means that there should be the science for artificial things, just like there is a science for the natural world. And I know some of the basic theorists of a computer, some of them uh, got Turing Award. Uh, their motivation was very practical. Uh, one of the theorists of the theorists, Sir Anthony Hora, 
Uh, he was also uh, the laureate of the Kyoto Prize. Um, he discovered uh, the basic algorithm quicksort, which is uh, most prevalently used in uh, the world now. According to him, uh, he needed to the operation of the programs to sort the, uh, the languages of Russian, and uh, that computation was so slow and he was motivated to develop quicksort. This is the most widely used idea today. Uh, of course, not everybody can develop a quick source or something like that, just like um, Sir Hore. Um, probably most of the cases we can bundle, do loop, and speed up by such and such percentage. But I think that's also fine. And it is much better than doing nothing because it's useful. I think it is important to enjoy research. And then where do the excitement of research come? Um, I think for me, the research is something like playing the intellectual game with the problems or the nature. In games and sports, we have to win, we have to compete by pre preparing lots of hands. That process itself is very inter interesting. And the research is the same as a researcher. You want to solve the problems by coming up with lots of ideas. How about this idea? We propose that. And then there is a logic or law of nature uh, which will uh, be a kind of opponent to us. And then they are going to say, that is not an essential solution. There is another way to go uh, forward. OK, then I'll come up with another idea. And then the opponent would say that, oh, that's essential part of the solution. That will be great. They will relent. This process is what I enjoy. Yes, it is a game. So winning is a primary goal. Athletes and chess players, they are called master or professional because they win. So as researchers, we needed to win in this intellectual game. We have to have the competitiveness to solve these essential problems, and we have to practice all the time. And that is the education, and that is what the training is all about. But after doing that sufficiently, we needed to be relaxed. Next, we will be here to enjoy the intellectual game, and then we can enjoy research. And if we can enjoy research, we can increase the odds of victory. In the world, there are lots of questions. There are things that we want to do differently. Professor Alan Newell used to say this passionately to his students. Actually, these questions are waiting for us to solve. We are competing with this natural providence or order of nature. We have to be just like ourselves and relaxed. And then we can enjoy the research and we can have a good result. Sometimes we can abstract these uh, problems and we can have a concept of a higher degree. Even if we do not, we can get a special solution for a specific problem. Whichever happens, that depends on our capacity and also luck. But either way will be fine, as long as it is useful and it has an impact, and as long as we can enjoy that process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we would like to offer flowers to Dr. Kanade.